Sumo Electronics Show opens in Las Vegas with cutting-edge technologies and gadgets for every home. Hello, I'm Arnon Nido and this is The Heat. From new concept televisions to robots and smart cars, the Consumer Electronics Show has something for everyone. This year, companies representing more than 150 countries and territories are showcasing their high-tech products in Las Vegas. Ahead, we'll discuss the return of Chinese companies to the show and one EV maker already taking pre-orders for a futuristic car. But first, CGTN's Mark New gives us a tour of what CES has to offer. CES returns in full force. In the wake of a COVID pandemic that drastically cut attendance, this year the show anticipates hitting 130,000 attendees, close to some of its peak years. Crowds are marveling at newly unveiled products like this transparent LG TV that allows you to see the picture and the real world behind it. Attendees also get a look at the future as Hyundai showed off a prototype of its massive fully electric autonomous excavator. Along the sidelines of CES, tech events like Pepcom are packed with companies, many of them focused on health and wellness. Zep began in Hefei, China, and now has a presence in more than 90 countries. The company is launching the Zep Clarity Pixie, a hearing aid that fits discreetly in the ear with 17 hours of battery life. It's also unveiling the AmazeFit Helio Ring that's designed for athletes. When the user wears this ring, um, it first is closer to the skin and it has several sensors. And within the sensors, we've got what we call a biotracker sensor that is able to read and analyze your, basically your blood and oxygen level. It also has another sensor that is able to gauge your performance level. So this is the all-in-one, if you like, smart ring that was designed with the athlete in mind. At CES, you'll also find products highly influenced by science fiction, like the Moonwalker, billed as the world's fastest shoe, which claims to more than double your walking speed. So I've practiced now, but I have no idea how to activate them. I'm a little nervous because I have fallen on electric roller skates before, but he's going to tell me how I activate this, how to activate it. For sure. So the easiest way to activate is lifting up your left heel, left heel, okay. and turn inwards. Here we go. Okay. See it turn into purple. Okay. Just walk. All you walk, okay. big step, big step. Okay. That was only half speed, so to go to full speed, it's turned the right heel inwards. Now, here we go. Full speed. What we're really proud of is the onboard gate AI system that allow us to detect and measure you know, hundreds of times a second that how people walk, and how fast they're walking, what's their intentions. We can detect people's intention to go faster or slower even before people can tell themselves. AI senses when to deliver motorized power to the shoe's wheels, creating something akin to being transported by a moving walkway. Okay, so I'm a two and a half times normal walking speed, pretty fast, about 10 kilometers per hour. Whoa, look out, coming through, coming through. Mark joins us now from the Shoffro. Quite a walk you went for, for there, Mark. Uh, but what kind of representation are you seeing this year at uh, CES from the Chinese tech companies? That's right. Um, I've been coming here for more than a decade, and it's really coming back. Um, you know, during the pan I mean, pre-pandemic, we saw a lot of Chinese companies, and then pandemic hit, uh, COVID pandemic hit, and it was really down to very little, just the major big companies and their representatives. Now I'm walking around and seeing so many smaller companies and talking to a lot of Chinese entrepreneurs who are so excited to be here for the first time. And if you look at the registration, it's about more than 1,100 Chinese companies that are actually at CS, and that is more than double the amount that were registered last year. Anand. Right now, Mark, the uh, Chinese EV maker, uh, Xpeng, is making its international debut with a flying car. That's the car there, right behind you. What can you tell us about this car? That's right. Well, uh, we've got on cue. Um, it should be opening right now. You can see that uh, it's really one of the big hits here at the event because it looks so dramatic. Uh, something out of the Transformers movie that you can see. The wings opening up, folding out, 
And this, you know, is is sort of a concept car right now, but they've actually done uh, previous tests before and said that they have got a similar vehicle up in the air flying already. So this, while well, this is the concept has actually been tested, and you can see this is really the showy one and how it folds out uh, pretty mazy and pretty dramatic. Now the company does have another type of uh, a sort of modular uh, air module, ground module vehicle that is taking orders at the end of the year. That's a bit different from uh, this vehicle and they're expecting to go into major manufacturing another year from that. So flying cars becoming a reality. Mark, stay with us. I want to bring in the rest of the panel for more on the Consumer Electronics Show. Joining us from Buffalo, New York is Lauren Fix. She's an automotive expert and editor-in-chief of Car Coach Reports. From Las Vegas, Ray Wong is the principal analyst, founder, and chair of Constellation Research. And Dan Ives is the managing editor of Equity Research at Wedbush Securities. He just left Las Vegas and joins us now from Westfield in New Jersey. Thanks to all of you for being with us. Uh, Dan, let me start with you. Um, you know, if we talk about the biggest technology that we hear about every day, it's AI, artificial intelligence. Um, and if there's anything tech, AI is not far away. Of course, it was ChatGPT that set it all off, the big buzz. Um, but what are you seeing in terms of how AI is being used in consumer electronics? What is it doing? Yeah, well, first of all, I, Mark almost looked like a professional demo for CES there, so that was impressive. I Look, it, from an AI perspective, I think it is the best and the most important CES in the last 25 years. And obviously, I would get interested to hear the rest of the panel because this AI revolution is hitting consumer and enterprise across the board. This is all about use cases. And for any of us that have come you know, to so many years like Ray and, and, and others in the panel, you see the difference. Because the monetization starting, it's a get out the popcorn moment, the AI revolution's here. So, Dan, give us an example of where we're seeing AI being used in a consumer product, something that we may use every day. Well, I think a lot of it you're going to see over the next three to six months, but I think healthcare is going to be the first area. That, that's where a lot of the big tech players are focused. That's where Apple, Amazon, I think you've seen Microsoft come out with healthcare products. Because you're really going to see interactive, generative AI that helps a consumer better understand their own health in ways that before was really seen as almost out of a sci-fi movie. Ray, great to see you. Um, we are finding, of course, AI being used more and more in uh, consumer uh, products, things like smartwatches, uh, cell phones, medical devices. It's even being used in our email. Gmail uses it. In fact, we had a guest here on a show not so long ago who told us that it's actually AI that reads those emails. But there is a focus to make all of this technology more human. Here's um, Adam Burden from Accenture talking about that. Let's listen. It's not sentient. It doesn't have, you know, feelings. It doesn't um, do things. It emulates and simulates um, human creativity. It helps us be better. It will amplify us as humans, uh, not compete with us. I like to say this, too, that um, AI uh, is not about making superhumans. It's about making humans super. So, Ray, how do you see this technology, artificial intelligence, evolving? Um, and, I mean, how will it change our lives? There are three big areas we're going to see, and as Dan said, AI revolution is here. I had breakfast with Dan, Adam as well, and what we we're, were talking about was, one, augmentation, the ability to help us do things we couldn't do on our own before much more quickly, augmenting the human with the machine. There's another area where we're augmenting the machine with the human so that we can get to a point of automation so that we can actually get the high levels of precision, 98% accuracy, 99% accuracy. That requires a training between the man and the machine, but when we get to full automation, that's going to be different. That's for safety. That's to meet regulatory requirements. And we're about to see that. But right now, what we're seeing is an explosion in ambient experiences. And those ambient experiences are things that happen in the background, things that we don't even know. For example, if you take a picture on your smartphone and suddenly it's not as blue as in the back as it should be, well, it's going to correct that. It's a little fuzzy. They're going to fill in the pixels. Those ambient experiences are already happening today. And we saw that all throughout CS through mm -hmm. the gadgets and, of course, what we're going to expect from autonomous vehicles to other types of propulsion. Right, and Ray, when you talk about things being more, uh, we see more precision, more accuracy, I mean, what are the things that will be more accurate and more precise? 
Yeah, so for example, your routing, your mapping, uh, your ability to actually connect with people at the right time, scheduling, those are enterprise use cases that we see. On the consumer side, it's just making sure that maybe you're trying to actually, you're going after a Ticketmaster ticket, maybe there's an application in the future that actually allows you to get the right price or resell a price at the right time. Uh, it's helping you instead of helping the system. We're going to see more apps that actually help individuals as opposed to help systems, and these are mindful apps and mindful technologies that are going to pop up. So here's an example. There's a Perfecta grill, and you can actually grill a one-inch ribeye steak in 90 seconds, and you once in and done. It's using AI to actually identify the moisture content and what the sizzle looks like based on the fat and every other uh, attribute in there. Yeah, I could use one of those. Lauren, great to have you with us. Uh, and when we Thank talk you. about artificial intelligence, of course, we've seen much uh, progress in the car industry. Uh, the quest to find self-driving cars, to find intelligent cars. Um, where have you seen AI being applied uh, in the car industry? I mean, this week Volkswagen uh, presented what was one of its vehicles with a chatbot powered by AI's chat mm -hmm. GPT. I mean, how, mm -hmm. how will our driving experience change? Well, Volkswagen is partnering with chat GPT, and I think it's really good to help people who are learning about the cars, where to go, uh, technology has evolved to a point that's quite dramatic. I should point out that the we've talked to Gary Shapiro in the past saying you should make this the number one big car show of the year, and he has done that with all the launches from cars on a global basis. Over 100 different brands were represented there, and you're seeing AI in almost every brand, including Mercedes-Benz with their EQG and their G-Class, their new Mercedes-Benz user experience. It's all AI-based. So instead of it being what you've seen in the past in a Mercedes-Benz, you're going to see something that's going to be more integrated from your home to your car to your life as you go places is everything's going to be very cohesive. And I think that's what consumers want. They want that not get in the car, start the vehicles, and hold on, wait for my Bluetooth to connect. It's going to just blend right in. And that makes it easier for consumers. BMW is partnering with Alexa and Amazon. Uh, even Lamborghini is doing a Telemetry X there, which is something you wouldn't expect from a supercar company. But they're all trying to think about ways of using AI to make it easier. Every single brand is getting involved in this, uh, including Sony working with Honda. That's now coming together with the Ophelia. They've been talking about building cars. Now they're going to build it using AI. And a lot of the Sony software partnering in with Honda is really smart. So you're getting the car manufacturers working with the tech companies. That's going to blend that all into one. Then adding mm -hmm. AI into the mix is going to make it easier for consumers. And we're also seeing a lot about hydrogen, too. So we're seeing a lot of really great technology. And that's what I love about the Consumer Electronics Show. Right, and Lauren, where does all of this technology fit in with uh, um, the, uh, the quest to get a self-driving car, an autonomous vehicle? Well, we are far from self-driving, although they can do it. In 2009, I rode in an Audi vehicle from Silicon Valley to Las Vegas for the CES show, and it worked. Everything worked. The problem is we've got a lot of hurdles that need to be cleared. Uh, right now, we're at level four. Level five would be completely autonomous, no pedals, no anything. And yes, you can get into some of the cool helicopters, whether it be the one you showed or the one that Hyundai is showing us. Uh, that's pretty cool. It's an air uh, taxi, essentially. So this, that type of technology can be done. The hurdle is government regulations, mm -hmm. insurance and reinsurance companies. We have weather, which is a very difficult thing to overcome, and then potentially hackers. So there has to be firewalls in place mm -hmm. to protect consumers. So although it could be produced today, every brand can do it. Mm -hmm. We're using this as a stepping stone to get consumers comfortable with the safety to help the system to be better drivers, to pay more attention on the road to lower deaths and accidents. And that's where AI is very helpful. I don't think consumers are ready to make that step yet. Mark, uh, you were showing us that flying car behind you. Well, Hyundai, um, the South Korean uh, car manufacturer, they've released the Super Now, which is its new flying taxi. Here's what the CEO of the company told us about this flying taxi. Let's listen. Our concept, as you can see here, have, has uh, eight rotors and all in the, in the same direction of the flight. So when you take off vertically, all uh, eight will be uh, generating the lift. And then when you cruise, all eight will be generating a, a thrust. So it's a highly efficient, very effective uh, design. And the beauty of it is it's all powered by battery. 
So, Mark, the company is hoping to bring this to market by 2028, but there's a lot to do before that. I mean, there's logistics, there's technology, there's obviously regulatory um, constrictions as well. But, I mean, how soon would it be before we'd be hailing a, an air taxi? Well, I think most research suggests 2028 is a time when we're going to be seeing a lot of these vehicles really hitting the cities. Uh, I've seen some estimates that as soon as the uh, maybe the end of 2025, we're going to start seeing some of these autonomous um, uh, flying car type vehicles. But again, infrastructure is a major thing. Cities really have to get on board and plan for this. For example, uh, you can't just go to any sort of road or whatever or airport and take off. You have to actually have built these sort of what they call vertiports. So cities really have to get on board and start to plan this. Otherwise, it's just going to take longer and longer. But most estimates are thinking 2028, we're going to see a major influx of these vehicles. Uh, Dan, of course, a lot of what we're seeing uh, right now at CS, I mean, it's futuristic stuff, but there's lots of robots at the show as well. In fact, Samsung rolled out a companion robot. That's what they call it, which one day it, this companion could be with you in your living room or could be at your dinner table. There's another company uh, with a robot called Moxie, uh, which is a replacement, actually, for a children's teddy bear. And this robot is able to interact with children. It's able to read to children as well. And we can see it there on the screen right now. Um, I mean, how soon could we see this kind of technology in our homes? Look, I think Lauren and Ray, I mean, they hit on very important points in terms of this CES, what's different, it's not just fringe, even on the robotic side. It's how it's going to be used in, in ways that are going to, I think, significantly shape enterprise and consumers. You look at what Tesla's done in terms of Dojo and, and the AI component. And robotics is going to be used on the consumer side. But actually, I think the, the really the golden goose is focused on robotics on the enterprise. And you're seeing some of that technology front and center that was really on display in the showroom in Vegas. Ray, um, televisions, that's another big, huge consumer product. It's in almost everyone's homes, but they're also seeing major developments uh, in technology. The screens of up to 100 inches. We're going to have glare-free screens. We're also going to have something called transparent televisions. Uh, what exactly is that and how does it work? Ray, did you hear me? Okay. The transparent, the transparent micro LED TVs are amazing. And it's basically a sheet of glass. And that sheet of glass, basically, you can see through it or you can actually watch television on it. Both Samsung and LG are at it. These are micro OLEDs. And of course, they're actually taking that technology to even thinner levels and higher refresh rates. A 480 hertz refresh rate means you can be see crystal clear pictures with very little motion issues that are happening. And that's the hot thing that's going on, especially on that display technology. Just when we thought the picture was perfect, they took it up another notch. And when can we expect to get these TVs, Ray? Well, I think some of them are going to be available in the next 12 months, and some are earlier in prototypes. And I think there's been industrial uses and special uses where these things have already been, uh, people are actually testing them out. So, but it's something that's in the near horizon and maybe in the next holiday season as they get ramped up on production and into scale. Lauren, let's talk a little bit more about uh, cars. Several automakers are releasing mm -hmm. new uh, electric vehicles at CES, but there's been a big focus uh, on, on range, and that, of course, mm -hmm. means we be talking about batteries. According mm -hmm. to the Department of Energy here in the United States, the average range for an electric vehicle is now 270 miles. Uh, mm -hmm. When can we expect to see that range perhaps triple, quadruple? Well, there only is one company right now that's got the long range over 500 miles, and that's Lucid. Uh, but what's important to note is that all the car manufacturers are working on this. They're also working on hydrogen. So it's a way to fill up essentially a tank with hydrogen in four minutes. I was at the BMW factory in Spartanburg, South Carolina. And we got a chance to test that out in a BMW X5. And you cannot tell the difference. It's an electric vehicle, but you use hydrogen. You're starting to see that with Kia and Hyundai. Uh, they had a huge presence there. Kia had a PV5 pickup truck. They had um, all kinds of connected technology, all kinds of concept vehicles, including their award-winning uh, Kia EV9, which just won uh, North American SUV of the year. Uh, and I, I was pretty impressed with what they have available and the fact that they're all starting to figure out that we need to 
charge quicker, have longer distances, and make it easier for consumers. That's one of the things consumers want. They also want more flexibility. They want pickup trucks, maybe one vehicle. Uh, one company that's been overlooked a lot, and it's a shame because they have great product, is VinFast. It's a Vietnamese company. Mm. They're building in Durham, uh, North Carolina, and they're come. They had quite a few launches there. They had the VF Wild, which is their pickup truck, a VF3 city car, and a Dragonfly electric bike, which is like a motorcycle. And that's what they're kind of known for. And you start looking at the companies coming in, the Chinese companies that are coming into the US, most people aren't aware of that, but they're building plants in Mexico and they're gonna start bringing those cars into the US. We've already test driven them with the World Car of the Year jury. And you're starting to see that hydrogen technology come into play. They're all talking about it, whether it be BMW, Mercedes, Audi, Hyundai, Kia, everybody can start realizing if you're going to make consumers buy these electric vehicles, you have to make it more convenient and you have to have the range and it has to be more cohesive and not just fighting a charging station or find, trying to find one. And this is a real smart way to do it. All we need is infrastructure like anything else. All right. And Lauren, you know, with all this technology being unveiled and showcased uh, at CES, but you know, we noticed that three big American car companies, the big three, GM, Ford, Stellantis, they're not there. Mm -hmm. And the Japanese right. giant, Toyota, they're not there either. Why is that? Well, for Stellantis, uh, the UAW put a real hurt on their available funds, plus they're switching everything over for the first time at the end of 2023. It was the end of their gasoline-powered supercars, like the Demon 170 and their last call supercars. And purchasing uh, platforms and going into battery operated cars is very expensive. So they're doing a lot of partnerships uh, with BlackBerry, with Harman, which was there also with some really great technology as far as new technologies. All of that costs money. So they said, we're not going to go to Chicago. We're not going to set up in mm -hmm. New York or LA. We're going to set up, well, they're going to have Jeep in New York. They're just going to focus on getting the product to market, which they're far behind General Motors and Ford. Uh, and as far as GM and Ford, it is very expensive to set up at the CES show. You have to be able to turn that into profits, not just sales. And, I, and they're not making money. Right now, if you're looking at some of these vehicles, like the Lightning F-150 truck, I found one online today with a $25,000 discount. That's a huge discount. That means they're not selling at the rate they would like. So consumers are, are calling the shots, whether they like it or not. You know, the free market does ring. Mark, you know, we're seeing a lot of products at CES which will either make us uh, very efficient or it could make us very lazy as well. I mean, there are things like AI-powered vacuums, mops, there's other appliances that are using AI as well, and there's even a $3,000 self-driving stroller. Yeah, I, I tried out that stroller actually a few months ago, and I think it's advanced a little bit, but um, that is uh, meant to have your hands free so it can kind of follow you here and there. But I think it's not supposed to be self-driving when you actually have a baby in it, so there is that protection. But what it can do is actually rock your baby back and forth, so you don't have to touch it and you can let it sleep, which I thought when I had you know a, an infant a long time ago, that would have been perfect. But there are a lot of interesting things here. I want to see the Perfecta Grill that uh, Ray talked about because I love food as much as him yeah. but also on the food theme there's like electric uh, barbecue grills that are full size now and you're not going to have those flare-ups you're not going to have the smoke you're not going to um, injure yourself and it's also six times as efficient so really sustainability in EVs uh, uh, electric technology really working its way into different sort of items Dan, we were talking about uh, television technology earlier on and the transparent television, uh, which we're about to see. But what about the content that gets onto television? I mean, there's lots of discussion about how future streaming services will work. There's talk of super bundles. Um, I mean, how is all this technology going to change our viewing habits? It's, it's an arms race, as it all plays out from the content providers. And I think what you're seeing, and Ray hit on some of the actual technology that it's all going to come out on. But this is all, even when you think about Vision Pro, what Apple has done, and Ray and I have talked about this, look how that's going to change content in terms of the actual form factors and how it's displayed. This is a new age that, that's really opening up, I think, kicking off at CES. And, and this is just the start of really the biggest transformation we've seen in tech in 30 years. So, Dan, would it be safe to say then that the age of, well, the old age now, of cable coming into your home, that's over? I wouldn't say it's over. I'd say it's, mm -hmm. it's transitioning at a rapid rate. And that's why big tech 
more and more is focused on owning content and you're really starting to see this battle in, from a streaming perspective that's just starting to play out, especially when it comes to live sports. Ray, of course, we are seeing all this technology, very advanced technology, but all of it has to work by connecting with uh, different things. What about connectivity? I mean, we have 5G speeds right now, but where is that going? I mean, are we going to see much faster speeds, much more efficient and reliable uh, connectivity? There are a lot of things that are being worked on for standards. Uh, you saw a couple of things that happen. Uh, you know, the ability to actually get to matter management, the ability. Um, so the, today, like if you want to actually stream something from your TV, uh, from your phone, uh, from your laptop, and put it onto a screen, right? Everybody has a proprietary standards. So we're seeing open standards there to improve uh, the sharing of content. Connectivity is only going to get faster, but we still haven't gotten the benefits out of 5G. But what we're going to see is private 5G networks that will actually allow people to connect more quickly. And of course, cables are getting much more quick. So we're having faster optical cables that are actually playing a role. Those optical cables that are used in cloud centers today will be get taken down to the consumer and of course, get down to a consumer grade. And then of course, the last piece is really important is, is power having enough power to do all this. And what we saw at CS was a lot of power banks, the ability to actually take home power, the ability to take consumer power and bring it with you. I mean, 24 kilowatt hour powers, they can hold 40 solar panels worth of energy in your house. And that's becoming consumerized. Before that was a very hard thing to do. And Ray, I was talking earlier on, uh, we were talking earlier on with uh, Lauren about autonomous vehicles, self-driving vehicles. I mean, how important will faster, more reliable connectivity be for that part of the industry? Oh, that's a great point. And Lauren made so many wonderful points talking about that connectivity. Um, take, for example, the John Deere tractor, the cat, uh, you know, the big haulers that they're using for their dump trucks. I mean, these are all going to be autonomous over time. And that level of precision and connectivity, you can't have a lag. A lag means you have a safety issue, uh, and that's the issue that people are worried about. And so you're seeing companies come at it from all different routes to ensure that they have the reliability, they have the safety capabilities, and of course, they've got the sensing technologies, that LIDAR that requires all that connectivity, the sensing that goes and brings the data back, the mapping technologies that actually you know, create the maps for safety and for a lot of the AI, that's all relying on having those private 5G networks to start with, and then hopefully better connectivity. Some might be from satellite. Lauren, very quickly, I've got about 20 seconds. You were telling us earlier on about that collaboration between Sony and Honda. And Honda's also saying that it will debut a global EV series, and that's part of its effort to launch 30 uh, new EVs by the end of the decade. Right. They're going to have the Zero series, and they're partnering with Sony. Uh, they also had a new H for their Honda logo that they right. showcased there. So it was, really, it was really impressive to see what Sony finally is coming through with a car. Right. Remember, Sony's got great audio. And so you're going to have great audio and great seating with Recaro okay. and a lot of other brands are starting to put this all together. It's going to be really interesting car future. Okay, and we have to leave that. Thank you to all of you for being with us. That's all we have time for. I'm Arnon Naidu in Washington, D.C.